Hi. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here at what Jim Aramanda and I have mutually agreed is the greatest banking and payments conference of all time. Um, we've also mutual, mutually agreed that we're both really good looking. Um, but, but this evening, at least, is not actually about payments or banking policy. It's about what my friends, who I see a lot of you in the audience know, is my favorite thing to do, which is to force other people to read books that I really like. Um, <laughs> Those on the association board know that they received a copy of Janesville, I think, last year. Um, and I've been keeping track of who's reading it and who is not. Um, but, you know, tonight we had Hillbilly Elegy to that happy family. Um, so let me get about the business of introducing our speakers, letting them say a little bit, and then I'll ask some questions. Um, we sort of lost the pigeonhole thing, but it's sort of an experiment. See if you like it. But if you want to ask a question of them, you type it in. I'll get it on this iPad up here. And then whatever question gets the most votes, that's the question I'll ask if it's not too offensive. Um, so to our authors, uh, let me start with Amy. Uh, Amy Goldstein is one of America's great reporters. She's written for the Washington Post for the past 30 years. She currently covers health care policy, but over the years has also been a White House correspondent and covered n numerous important events, including the Columbine shootings and five of the past six Supreme Court nominations. She was part of the Washington Post team that was awarded the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for coverage of the 9-11 uh, attacks and the government's response to those attacks. She was also a Pulitzer Prize finalist for national reporting for an investigative series on the medical treatment of immigrants detained by the federal government. Amy's book, Janesville, tells the story of Janesville, Wisconsin, a town founded a few years before the Civil War and the kind of time, town we idealize in America. Beneficent founding fathers, a philanthropic tradition, and close community bonds. And yet also, unfortunately, deeply reliant on a single General Motors assembly plant for its economic lifeblood, which was cut off in 2008. Her book details what that meant for the people of Janesville and the community itself. I'm also pleased to report that Janesville was my son's first assigned reading at Georgetown University this semester in a freshman uh, seminar taught by the university president called The Common Good. Now, if you'd like to know J.D. Vance's biography, there's a book in front of you that will do that quite nicely. Um, but in a nutshell, as I trust you will all read, because you have to, um, he rose from rough and humble beginnings uh, to attend college at Ohio State University. Congratulations on Saturday's game, by the way. And to serve in the Marine Corps and graduate from Yale Law School. After law school, and of course after writing this book, J.D. moved to San, San Francisco to work in venture capital with Peter Thiel, or is it Thiel? I never know. Um, he then returned to Ohio more recently and is the managing partner of the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, part of Steve Case's Resolution, Revolution Network. He's a CNN critic, contributor, and there may even be a, a movie in the works. Um, JD's Hillbilly Elegy tells the story of his tribe, working class white Americans of Scots Irish descent, millions of whom have no college degree. They began as day laborers in the southern slave economies and then became sharecroppers, coal miners, machinists, and mill workers. They have done poorly in post-industrial America and are its most pessimistic group. So while the topics of these two books are similar, the approach of the authors could not be more different. I read Janesville first and admired it as a reporter's story. Probably like most readers, I was eager to find villains and heroes. And yet Amy refused to make that easy. She simply told the story objectively, and as a result, in a way that provided deep understanding. I then turned to Hillbilly Elegy, which could not be a more personal story, a vivid portrayal of JD's family, friends, and larger community, and the damaged culture of Appalachia. JD tells his story subjectively, and in a way that provides deep understanding. But at this point, I will let you, I will turn to the authors who can tell you a little bit more about what's in their books and why they wrote them, um, and then we'll have a little chat. I don't know if you guys have flipped for who goes first. But. So you can go here or there, up to you, whichever's more comfortable. I'm fine here if this is okay. Great. Um, thank you for making it sound good. <laughs> for inviting us here tonight. Um, I think you give a really good description of the distinction and the commonalities of our book, so I appreciate that, for starters. Um, 
I was, uh, about a decade ago, covering a very broad social policy beat for the Washington Post in which I could get away with doing a lot of different things. And I decided to do a few stories about something that I didn't yet know were called um, recession effects, which was what was the ground level view of what difference it made that the uh, US economy was in the midst of the Great Recession. Um, I did one story out of Southwest Florida, uh, which was one of the uh, hubs uh, or depths of the um, housing crisis that was one of the uh, stimuluses for the bad economy. And I spent a couple days just hanging out in a welfare office, um, talking to people who had been middle class people who were, for the first time in their lives, um, applying for government benefits and were just shell-shocked uh, to find themselves there. Uh, it just was not how they viewed themselves, how they viewed their relation to the government, and they were pretty upset. And I had never really seen anything like this before in a long career, and I thought, there's something really profound going on in this country. Um, and when I looked at what a lot of the writing was, then there's a lot of journalism being done at the time about uh, the state of the economy. I realized a lot of it was from the macro view. It was looking at uh, then pretty new President Obama's economic stimulus policy and whether it was good or bad and whether the government should be rescuing uh, banks and auto manufacturers. And there wasn't much writing um, that was deep that I saw about what difference it made to individuals and communities uh, when good work was going away. And um, I can only say that I became sufficiently obsessed by being a, like a little one-woman corrective to that, that I took a leave from my job for the first time in my career to try to find a community that I could write about that could serve as a microcosm or a metaphor uh, for what really happens when work goes away. So if you think about it, if I was going to tell this story microcosmically, um, I need to be pretty careful about what community I chose. And uh, Janesville, Wisconsin was not a place where um, I knew anyone. I had never been there. I think I had, in my whole career at that point, done one newspaper story out of Wisconsin. It was not a state that I knew. Uh, but somebody had mentioned to me when I was looking for settings for a couple of these recession effect stories that I was doing for the Washington Post, that there was a small southern Wisconsin city that had lost a big old auto plant. Um, it was the oldest operating auto plant uh, in all of General Motors when it closed down two days before Christmas of 2008. And all those words in the sentence that I just articulated here I thought would be good for writing about a place. <laughs> um, and it just lingered in my mind. I never went out there before uh, to do a story on it for the Post, uh, because when I first heard of it, the plant closing was pretty fresh. And a lot of the GMers themselves were still getting something called subpay, which is um, extra unemployment pay for union workers. So the pain for many people hadn't really begun to seep in. But when I began not long after thinking about doing this larger piece of work, it just lingered in my mind um, in a kind of fixating kind of way. Um, and I thought about why and what were the criteria that I should use to choose a place. Uh, one of them was that I wanted it to be a community that had never before been part of the American Rust Belt uh, because I wanted to be focusing on what this bad economic time had done to a place not to be writing about kind of an accumulation of economic de decline over a few decades. Um, I also, of course, needed to be a place that lost a lot of jobs, and Janesville definitely fit the bill on that score. Um, it's the county seat of Rock County, uh, Wisconsin, and the county in 2008-2009 uh, lost about 9,000 jobs, uh, GM jobs and jobs from suppliers that had grown up around this old, old auto plant. Uh, and then just small businesses that went out because there weren't enough people who could go out to eat or join bowling leagues or buy things. Um, so there was just this cascade of job loss in this part of southern Wisconsin. Uh, that was an important factor. Um, it was also a politically interesting place. Um, before I knew 
anything else about Janesville before I'd ever paid a first visit there. Um, I knew that it was an old United Auto Workers town that tilted Democratic and was represented in Congress by a still um, pretty young congressman at the time named Paul Ryan. Uh, he wasn't committee chair yet. He hadn't been chosen to be vice presidential candidate. In fact, I chose Janesville a year before Mitt Romney chose Ryan. And uh, I remember that August morning of 2012 when people who knew that I had by that point been working on this for about a year all emailed me at the same time saying like, that's your guy and that's your place. Um, so that turned out to be fortuitous for writing about it. Um, you know, it also needed to be a place where people would talk to me. Um, so I made a couple of exploratory visits to just see what it felt like there and whether it seemed like people would cooperate with a total outsider who wanted to understand what happened when all these uh, auto jobs had gone away. And um, people were pretty hospitable to me. Um, and they remained hospitable for, um, for several years that I was going in and out of Janesville uh, to try to understand the community and people in it. Um, I've got to say, I also like the name Janesville. It's just mm -hmm. an all-American sounding name. And if I figured out it's going to be living with a name and typing a name, I want it to be an appealing name that had the right American ring. So that seemed an advantage. Um, and let me just say that my idea for writing about this book was, as you said, and I appreciate your comment about um, uh, my bringing kind of an objective, neutral eye towards uh, the characters I was writing about. Um, I wanted this book to feel like a kaleidoscope. So you were seeing a chronology of it turns out to be five years from the announcement of the plant closing in um, June of 2008 uh, through about five years uh, forward in time. I want you to see that chronology from the vantage point of different people in town. Uh, so I chose some people who were from different perspectives trying to do something about all this job loss. Um, uh, people who were educators, people who uh, were social service providers, um, the guy who ran the job center, uh, some politicians. You know, I really wanted to feel what it was like to try to fix this uh, from different people's perspective. Um, but the core of the story is um, three families of auto workers who all lost their work. And I chose people, um, as I came to think about it, who came up with different answers to the question, what to do when there were no good choices left. And we can talk a little bit about um, you know, the choices that these people made. Um, and I guess the final thing I want to say by way of introduction is that I wasn't expecting to come here tonight on a day when General Motors announced uh, this morning that there were going to be five more plant closings. Uh, and I've been hearing today, of getting emails from strangers who said, uh, one of whom said, you know, I read your book and my brother works at the plant in Ontario, Canada, and I wonder whether these things are going to happen here too. Yeah, so uh, first, thanks so much for, you, for Amy for doing this and for the Clearinghouse for having me. Um, I'm J.D. Vance. I know I moved my placard here, but unless you're terrible context clues, you probably assume that I'm J.D. Vance. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I, I wrote my book for you know, much more personal reasons, and really the, the idea came to me when I was a student in law school, and I had been there for, I don't know, maybe six months, maybe a year, and thought to myself, you know, I'm, I'm just not in Kansas anymore. Uh, people like me are not meant to be here. I don't feel like I belong here. I'm meeting some cool people. I'm learning some interesting things, but I really don't feel as though people like me belong in a place like this. And, and why is that? Why is it that I feel like such a cultural outsider? Um, that led me to ask, slightly bigger questions, and some of those questions are of course reflected in the book that I ultimately wrote, which is, you know, why is it that kids like me, kids who come from the background that I came from, call it working class, a family did, that did not have any college graduates, uh, why was it so rare for kids like me to be in institutions like Yale, institutions that are ultimately, as, as we all know, gateways to some of the higher educational and work opportunities that exist in our society, and so I realized that in a fundamental way, I was asking a question about 
uh, what we often call, and what a lot of folks call, the American dream. This idea that no matter where you came from, no matter who your parents are, no matter what geography you were born in, so long as you work hard, so long as you play by the rules, you can achieve your fair share of American opportunity. You can send your kids uh, to Yale Law School. And, and it was quite obvious to me that as, as much as that story was very important to me growing up and as much as I believe in it in a very fundamental way, it wasn't quite true for a whole lot of people because there weren't any other people like me at Yale Law School. Indeed, as I, as I talk about in the book, the person who was most like me uh, was a black guy from inner city Toronto. And when you come from sort of Appalachian, southeastern Kentucky and southwestern Ohio, uh, and the person who's most like you is an African Canadian from Toronto, you sort of start to wonder, well, that's not a whole lot of obvious similarities. What is it about our shared experience uh, that makes us both feel like we're a bit of, of a cultural outsider to this place? And so I really wanted to interrogate and ask that question why, why is that? Why are there so few kids who are coming from backgrounds like mine who are making it to this place? Uh, why are there so few people who seem to think that a life like the one that I'm leading is so possible? And the more that I wrote and the more personal it became, why is it that even though I've been gifted with this unbelievable opportunity, you know, I, I knew pretty much from the moment that I got to Yale that I would not have any of the struggles that had characterized my life up to that point. I knew that I would never really worry about where I worked, that I would always have a marketable credential in the labor market. I knew that I would be able to earn enough money to provide for my family, to provide for my kids. I knew that I would never really worry about money in the way that people where I grew up worried about money. And yet, there were all of these things that made it impossible for me to be happy, to do well, to feel stable and comfortable, to feel like I belong to this place. Why is it I'm here, I got in, why is it that this place is so unfamiliar and so culturally alien? And so that, that's ultimately why I decided to write the book. So I imagine that some of you have read it, for those of you who haven't, the thing that I focus on is not the economic calamity or the various economic calamities that affected my hometown of Middletown, Ohio. And certainly there were many. Um, it's, it's really interesting that Amy talked about this single calamitous event, the closure of the GM plant in Janesville. Uh, well, there wasn't a single calamitous event that you can point to in my hometown. There were sort of a series of successive events. Uh, certainly, the 2000, 2000, 2007, 2008 recession was tough for my hometown. Certainly, it was affected by the cyclical occurrences in our economy as much as any other place. Uh, but really, the story of Middletown from the 1970s through maybe the 2000 you know, early 2010s, is that it was a place where even during the good times, it wasn't make it, making as much progress as other places. And during the bad times, it was certainly making a lot worse progress than other places. Uh, so there was a steel mill, Armco Steel, eventually became a AK Steel because Armco was, was uh, merged with Kawasaki. It employed about 10,000 people at the peak of its economic fortunes. It employed about 1,400 people uh, by the time uh, that I was in high school. But that was gradual. It's not like it shed 8,500 8, jobs overnight. It really just was affected by globalization, by manufacturing competition, and it shed a fair amount of jobs every year for a very long period of time. And that's how it found itself in the position that it was in. And so really what my book was about was not primarily the economic impacts. I took for granted, and I sort of, I said this, I think, in the introduction of the book, clearly something economically has been happening to the blue-collar manufacturing workforce in hometowns like mine. Let's set that to the side. What else is going on? What's going on in communities like mine? Uh, what happens when a problem that maybe was created by economic conditions two or three generations before begins to take on a life of its own? What happens when a kid even a kid who's very fortunate, who comes from circumstances like mine, finds themselves in a place like Yale Law School. Why is it they feel so out of place? Why is it they struggle to do things that I think a lot of people in this room probably take for granted? Be in a successful, stable relationship, have a job that's relatively comfortable, relatively uh, stable. Why is it that so many of these things that upper middle class or professional class Americans take for granted, why was it so hard for the people like me? Why was it so hard for the family like mine? And the conclusion that I ultimately draw uh, is that it's really complicated. There isn't sort of one thing that I can point to. I talk a lot about family dissolution. 
I talk a lot about trauma. I talk a little bit about the economic factors that led to Middletown's problems. I talk about addiction. I talk about the decline of community institutions like churches, like bowling leagues, like things like that. And what's tough about this, of course, is that all these different things are influenced by each other. I think it's impossible to understand the decline of family stability without appreciating the economic forces that are driving some of these problems. It's impossible to understand the decline of community institutions without understanding the fact that a lot of families are more traumatic and more chaotic than they were maybe 40 or 50 years ago. And so the, the conclusion I think that's in, unsatisfying in some ways, it's certainly unsatisfying to me, is that the reason this is happening, the reason kids like me are not achieving the American dream is really, really complicated. It's not a single factor or even a half dozen factors. It's probably 30 or 40 different things all working together and all reacting with each other. And the way that I try to deliver that story or deliver that message is through a family memoir. It's not primarily a sociological study. It's not primarily, as Amy's book is, a journalistic report. It's not primarily a, a work of social science. It is primarily a bit of family storytelling. I'm telling you what happened to my grandparents, what happened to my parents, and of course, what happened to me. And, and I guess the final point that I'll make, the final thing I'll say during this introduction, just to give you some sense of how I, how I approach this problem, there's a story that I tell in the book that, you know, I've, I'm in Yale Law School, I'm at this fancy law firm recruiting event, and I find myself completely unable to manage the social expectations and the social norms of this situation. So a woman comes up during a cocktail reception and asks me, do you want Chardonnay or Sauvignon Blanc? And, and I remember thinking at the time, she's screwing with me. She's playing a joke on me. Uh, just give me some wine. Stop throwing around these fancy French words. Um, but things like that kept on happening. And while it's funny, and certainly I, when I told the, book, the story in the book, I meant it to be funny, there is something a little bit weird and a little bit underappreciated about the fact that we take even the lucky few kids who make it out of circumstances like mine into these rarefied elite circles, and they don't quite know what to do. They don't quite know how to take advantage of the opportunities they're presented. They don't quite know how to conduct themselves at a law firm recruitment dinner. They maybe don't know how to manage their personal finances. That's something else I talk about a little bit in the book. They don't understand or don't appreciate how to take the lessons that maybe they learned in a chaotic home and translate that to a successful 21st century marriage and eventual family life. You know, These things are hard, and I, I don't know that we are as a society willing to appreciate just how tough it is to translate the opportunities that I was given into something long-term and durable, participation in the sort of American dream in a way that isn't just possible for the lucky few, but that's possible for an entire generation of kids. And as I talk about a little bit in the book, I don't know that we're necessarily comfortable with the implications of what it would look like for a lot more kids who come from my background to partake in the American dream. Because frankly, uh, the, the word that economists use is upward mobility. And upward mobility, at least in a relative sense, if you know 20 kids from the bottom quintile are gonna earn an income at the top quintile, that means that 20 kids at the top quintile have to fall out of that top quintile. And I don't know that we're totally comfortable with what's necessary if we actually want the American dream to be available and alive, not just like I said, for me, for the lucky few, but for everybody. Awesome, thank you both. So I guess as a first question, and JD, while your story is generally a personal one, um, there was a fair amount of sociological and other research you cited at the beginning and I think throughout just sure. about the attitudes of the Appalachian white middle class, which I found startling and perhaps you know, an explanation of some recent political events. But could you just sort of do a little survey of that for folks? Because I, I think it would be newsy. Sure. So the evidence suggests that the white working class, which is a term that I think is used and misused in a lot of ways, but is typically defined as white Americans without a college degree, that they are unusually pessimistic among the American population. And in some ways, of course, that pessimism is justified. So uh, we know, for example, that mortality rates for the white working class are rising. We know that the opioid epidemic, which is affecting everybody, is affecting white working class Americans in an especially disproportionate way. Uh, we know that if you're a white working class 
uh, child, your life expectancy is actually a little bit lower than it was for children 10 or 15 years ago, which is unique really among all groups in the country and maybe in the world, or at least in the industrialized world. There's no other segment of the population, large segment of the population that's actually seeing its life expectancy go down in the advanced world. That's pretty significant and, and pretty bad. Uh, but I also think that pessimism is in some ways not justified, or at least it's a little bit hard to square. Of course, we know that a lot of folks are still materially worse off. Uh, we know that some people are still doing a little bit worse off. The, you know, maybe the average black working class American is maybe a little bit worse off than the white working class American. So in some cases, the pessimism is just, and justified. In some cases, that pessimism is not totally easy to square with the data. And my takeaway from that, or at least I, I think the political ramifications of that, are that um, you know, in, in 2016, we know, of course, most white working class Americans are Republicans. And it was really interesting to see the different, I think there were, what, 16 or 17 Republican candidates who were running in the beginning. They were considered credible. They were, they were well-funded. And a lot of them had these super optimistic messages about the future, these super proactive messages about what they wanted to do. And I think that a lot of people back home, yeah, of course, they want a pathway to the future. They want a better life. They want all these things. But they also just wanted somebody to acknowledge, you know what, we're, we're kind of unhappy and we're kind of pissed off. And the only candidate who did that, the only candidate who I think strayed from classical Republican dogma on a lot of issues, the only person who really, I think, gave voice to that sense of pessimism uh, was Donald Trump. And it's not surprising, of course, that he won, uh, won the Republican primary and eventually won the presidential contest. Yep. So yeah. if you haven't guessed by now, this isn't going to be a super happy kind of experience. Uh, but, We're doing but, our best. Yeah, yeah, there'll be drinks after. Um, but, but in terms of you know what's the answer, which of course is what we all want to know. I mean, I think one of the most surprising aspects of your book, Amy, um, was sort of the on the ground reporting about job retraining, which I think is generally the one thing both parties can agree to is the one thing we need to do for displaced workers is get them job retraining and there's funding for that. Um, and so I think it was sort of surprising to read what you found happening in Janesville around that, if you could talk about that. Yeah, well, I was really interested in the question of job retraining because it occurred to me pretty all early on that if I was looking at what happens when people fall out of the middle class, then the so sequel question was, well, can they climb back up? And what do we as a society and what do we as a set of government policies recommend people do about it. So as you say, job retraining is a pretty widely popular remedy, or purported remedy. Yes. Uh, another reason why I chose Janesville to look at was because it has a technical college, uh, which is um, Wisconsin has a technical college system that does just vocational training. And uh, there's a little school called Black Hawk Technical College right in Janesville that uh, not long after all these auto jobs went away was just slammed with laid off factory workers. Uh, so I figured I had a little lab in front of me. So I spent a lot of time at the college um, trying to get a sense of what were they doing. Um, and it turns out that it's pretty hard to educate laid off factory workers. I mean, if you think about it, these were people, for the most part, in their 30s and their 40s who hadn't been in school for half a lifetime. Uh, some of them had never been to college, as you talk about the white working class, J.D. Um, some of them may have had a year or two of college and felt kind of unfocused. And there was a, you know, auto job paying, you know, at the end it was $28 an hour wages, pretty good working class wages, right there. Um, so education wasn't something that was very appealing for some of these folks. You know, they were being told they had to study um, as they worried about putting food on the table for the families. Um, one of the things that folks at the college told me that were most surprised by was that many of these people came in not knowing how to use a computer. Um, and some folks dropped out when they realized that they couldn't turn in papers longhand. Um, so this college was pretty enterprising. I mean, they started a computer scoop band. They started uh, study skills uh, sessions. They held um, picnics in the late summer for the incoming you know, factory workers trying to turn in students and their families just to kind of make it a more uh, 
hospitable place to be prepared to hang out at. Um, but it didn't always work, and I know that didn't always work from people who I got to know in town, but also from a statistical analysis that I did as part of the research for this book with a couple of labor economists. Um, we got some data from Wisconsin's Department of Workforce Development um, uh, and some college data. And uh, to simplify what we did, we basically looked at people in this part of southern Wisconsin, all of whom had been laid off after 2007, a couple years after 2007, as the recession was uh, taking hold, who either had or had not gone back to school, and then looked to see how were they faring a few years afterwards. And this is what you were alluding to. I mean, the data were pretty sobering. We found that the people who went back to school uh, were by 2011, 2012, less likely to have a job than the people who had not retrained. If they had a job, they were less likely to be working all four quarters of the year. Um, we couldn't see who was doing part-time or full-time work, but we could see sort of seasonal you know, uh, consistency in work or not. Uh, and for those who were working, uh, their pay drop from before the recession to a few years afterwards was much greater than for those who had not gone back to school. And you know, the data don't say the why. Um, but you can imagine I spent a lot of time talking to people who think about this for a living about what I was looking at and talking to people who ran uh, and ran counseling at the local job center, which is kind of ground zero for where you went when you lost a job you thought were going to last forever to figure out what to do about it. And I think it's partly a function that uh, the economy, you know, people at this college thought and people in the town's economic development department and people who were in the job center thought that jobs were going to come back after this recession at the same rate that they had from previous recent uh, US recessions. And that turned out not to be the case. So people were aiming for jobs that didn't exist yet by the time they finished school. I think it's also true that people who sort of succeeded um, may have been starting out at the bottom rung of a new kind of work. Uh, so that was a reason for a pay drop. And I don't know if we could replicate this with data more recently, whether it would show that the differential between people who had and had not retrained would narrow by now. Um, but it was just pretty clear that uh, going back to school, at least in this part of southern Wisconsin at this time, was not a sure route back to the middle class. OK. Um, so I think now back to JD. Um, and again, it's, the, the differences in the books to me are really remarkable. Because I mean, I, I think a Amy paints the picture of folks who are, you know, the expression used to be doing the right thing and playing by the rules um, and not really getting a lot for it. But I mean, I, I think JD um, paints a, a, a pretty stark and unflattering picture of his, um, you know, the other folks in his community who I think you describe as, you know, sort of self-report as being quite industrious and hardworking, but actually are rather lazy, don't go to work, go to work late, um, and yet still feel aggrieved, are spendthrifts, spend money they can't afford to spend, um, which seems to get to an even deeper problem, I think, potentially, than the, the efficacy of job training. And how do you turn that around? Um, other than, I mean, obviously, you're sort of the unicorn or the, the, the rare exception. But are there any ideas about how to change a cultural attitude towards work? Yeah, so, so the, the one thing I'd say is that you, you certainly see both sorts of people. I think I say in the book, you know, most people are trying hard and most people are playing by the rules, but you, you certainly saw folks who maybe had access to a job but weren't willing to work in it, or they went to work but they got fired for totally predictable reasons, and afterwards they would lash out at an employer uh, for the fact that they, they didn't do especially well in that job. You know, the, the way that I would illustrate this is that uh, my grandparents were, I think, incredibly hardworking and industrious people. They certainly had their problems, but I think everybody has their problems. Uh, and they struggled too. And what was tough about the community in which I lived in is that a lot of people were struggling, both people who were really, really gritty and determined, and also people who weren't so gritty and weren't so determined. And you certainly see, saw, saw both, both sides of that coin. Um, but but I, I think that the, the really difficult and really fundamental question is, uh, 
once something has become a multi-generational problem, how do you break out of it? You know, if, if you look at the data, um, I, I was talking with the Lieutenant Governor of Utah about this actually maybe a, a year and a half ago, and he commissioned an analysis of the folks in, who were receiving various welfare benefits in the state of Utah, and w the conclusion, which matches other conclusions from a number of different uh, geographies, is that when we talk about the problem of poverty or upward mobility, we often conflate two separate groups of people. So one group of people is are, are the, the folks who are maybe down on their luck, they lost a job after a recession, they were unemployed for three to six months, they received welfare benefits for three to six months. Um, those folks tend to not stay in poverty for a very long period of time. It's a temporary thing, somebody goes back to work, things largely work out for those folks. Um, or at least they're not quite as dire as they are for the second group of people. And the second group of people are those who are the long-term, multi-generational, almost chronically poor or impoverished. The folks who, it's not just that you know they lost a job and they're consequently in financial dire straits for a few months, but they lost the job and also their parents are not working and their parents before that didn't work. And you see this really intense multi-generational problem. How do you solve the problem for those folks? And that's in some ways what I think you're getting at, what certainly there, there are significant parts of the book that are about that particular problem. Um, my honest answer, not to you know, continue with the pessimism here, is that I don't totally know the answer to that question. Um, it's really hard to take folks who are the fifth generation to suffer from some measure of poverty and to get them back in the workforce. Um, I was actually just talking with a, um, a high school teacher in my, uh, in, in my high school in Middletown yesterday, actually, and he was talking about how unbelievably difficult it is just to get some of the kids in his class to muster the emotional reserves to focus on the daily lesson plan. You talk about you know, kids who have very significant and very obvious traumatic problems from the moment they walk in the door. This isn't a failure of the education system when these kids were in the third grade. This is these kids come in on the, when they're four or five years old and they're so far behind their peers and they're suffering not just intellectually, it's not just that they haven't had as many books read to them as they, when they were children, they haven't heard as many vocabulary words, uh, but they're emotionally traumatized from growing up in incredibly chaotic homes, from seeing abuse, from seeing drug addiction. What do you do for those kids? Um, I don't know. Uh, the, the, you know. Part of the answer is undoubtedly rebuilding the community that is around them, right? So if you can take a community like Middletown and create some real long-term lasting economic development, you take the folks who are maybe on the margins but are fundamentally, they have the social and human capital to persevere through pretty tough problems, you prevent those people from becoming the long-term and multi-generational poor so you can create some community, um, so, some, some real cultural capital in a given community so that when people are down on their luck, there are actually people there who can maybe take care of a kid who doesn't have a home or can be supportive, can be a mentor to a kid who comes from an especially traumatic home like mine. Uh, that, that's undoubtedly part of the solution. Um, but if you look at the data, to go back to you know, what, what Amy was talking about with community colleges, we do okay at taking the temporarily poor and giving them some access to opportunity, giving them some ladder out of the situation that they find themselves in. We're really, really bad at taking the fifth generation poor and getting them to some measure of upward mobility and some measure of financial stability. It's just, uh, it's, it's, it's just a fact of life. Um, and to me, what worries me most is that between the opioid epidemic, which is not just killing a lot of people, it's also, if you think about it from the perspective of the children, it's leaving a lot of kids orphaned and in very, very tough circumstances. Uh, if you think about the, the most recent recession, which in some ways we still haven't fully, you know, we're just on the cusp of returning to labor force participation numbers that we had in 2006 or 2007. So we in some ways still haven't recovered from, uh, from that recession. My worry is that we're taking the multi-generational poor and we're actually 
increasing the number. We're increasing the number of people who are really, really in tough circumstances long term. And uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough problem. And I think there are certainly things that we can do on the margin. There's evidence of things that we can do that have worked uh, for, for a number of people. But is there a single policy solution or anything else that I can point to that says we're going to take the, you know, the 9 million long-term labor force dropouts and get half of them in the workforce? Uh, no, I don't have the answer to that question. So I, I think, you know, a lot of people think, you know, two potential bedrocks of any community in a place to help improve cultures are first the schools and second the church. Sure. Um, and so I think I'll turn to each of you, uh, and you each get one bedrock. Um, so, I mean, Amy, I thought, you know, in Janesville, I, I, I thought it, it turned out, it seemed to me, that the schools actually were a wonderful resource, not just for education, but for effectively for social service services. I think, I can't remember his name, Derry, was one of, I mean, one of my favorite characters, not character, it's not a character, she's a real person, yeah. one of my favorite people in the book. Um, and so, I mean, I guess maybe this would be the one turning the frown upside down. If you could talk a little bit about, you know, how how the school played a larger role than we might have expected. And we're talking here about the elementary secondary schools, not necessarily the community college. And then, you know, I, I think in Hillbilly to Elegy, one of the great surprises to me, there were a lot of surprises, was the role of the church in Appalachia, because I think most people in, certainly on the two coasts, think that all the flyover states are going to church all the time, yep. and that's what they do. Um, and I think your numbers showed that your church attendance in your area is about what it was in San Francisco. Yep. Um, and in other words, not high. Um, and I don't know if part of the cultural problem, if people are not going to church because they're miserable or if they're miserable because they're not going to church. Um, but if you could talk about maybe after we do the schools, talk about maybe the role of the church and what you saw. Sure. But Amy first. Well, I was also interested in the question of what did all this job loss mean for kids, um, kids coming of age, teenagers coming of age, and younger kids. And the Janesville school system is a pretty good school system. Uh, you know, like any community had richer and poorer parts of town, but on balance, it's a pretty functional school system. And um, I got to know some teachers um, who were very sensitive to the fact that they were observing some of their formerly middle class kids who looked like they weren't doing as well. Uh, you know, coming to school a little scruffy looking, coming to school you know, falling asleep because they hadn't had breakfast in the morning. Um, the percentage of students all across the school system who qualify for federal lunch subsidies was increasing, even in schools that had been the more affluent schools. Uh, so a couple of the, in my little kaleidoscopic manner of trying to focus on different people's perspective or trying to figure out what in the world to do about all this, um, there are two educators um, whose stories run through the book. One, as you mentioned, is a woman named uh, Derry Whaler. She's married now, but that was her name during the years I was uh, so happy writing about her. You. Yeah, no, she had a partner, but they got married. <laughs> um, and um, she's great. Uh, she, uh, on her own, she, so, okay, you need to know, I'm gonna digress for a second and come back to Derry. Um, the school systems are named, the two high schools are named Parker and Craig. Parker for the Parker Penn Company because Parker Penn was founded in Janesville, Wisconsin. And it was actually fading before General Motors went away. Um, Craig was, uh, just after World War I, the guy who persuaded the founder of General Motors to buy a farm implements company in Janesville. It started out making tractors and then it started making Chevrolets. So you've got these two kind of iconic founding industrialists whose identities are embedded in the names of the high schools. Okay, so Derry works at Parker High School. She's a social studies teacher. And she's just this very empathic young woman. And she um, goes to her principal and says, can I have a storage closet that's not being used very much to turn it into something I want to call the Parker Closet? And what she did was she started initially on her own and then with a lot of community help collecting donations, um, used jeans, school supplies, um, shampoo and conditioner, prom dresses so girls could afford to go to the dances in the spring. Um, and she very um, discreetly introduced kids who she thought might need these things to the existence of this room because she didn't want to embarrass them. 
And one of the three families, kind of at the core of my story, a family named Whitaker, has two twin daughters who I met when they were in high school. And uh, one day, um, Derry introduces Kasia Whitaker, one of the twins, to this room. And Kasia is just blown away, first of all, that there's this generosity going on in the school. But secondly, it like dawns on her like a flash that if this room exists, her family must not be the only one that's struggling. Because these kids were not talking about this. I mean, the fact that your family was not doing well, that was like a private thing in your own home. I mean, if you were a formerly middle class family, you did not expose, and the kids did not expose with their friends, that things were falling apart. Uh, so Derry was kind of one of the heroines of this story. Uh, let me just say briefly that there's another educator who's a school social worker. Her name is Anne Forbeck. And Anne is great. Um, Anne's job was to uh, be a liaison to the school system for um, homeless kids. Uh, to try to make sure that they weren't dropouts as well as homeless if she could prevent it. And uh, she notices that there is a growing crop of homeless kids. Well, Janesville, Wisconsin does not think of itself as a place with a lot of homeless kids. Um, and Derry and the social worker from the next school system over, uh, Beloit, Wisconsin, which is just to the south on the Illinois line, uh, start raising money for housing for unaccompanied homeless teenagers. And at first, I mean, there's a local filmmaker who makes a film to try to publicize that this is going on, interviewing three of these homeless kids. And they have an initial screening. And a lot of people in the community show up. And they just can't believe it. Um, but this little project from these two social workers start raising a lot of money. Uh, and eventually, they've opened a home for girls. And I think they're about to open one for homeless teenage uh, boys who don't have a parent in proximity. And I think that that's really a fundamental difference between the community I'm writing about and your hometown in terms of you use the phrase social capital. Mm -hmm. um, I think that Janesville lost a lot of jobs, but it didn't have the loss of social capital. They mm -hmm. still had a sense of resourcefulness and resilience, and we can try to make this work as best we can, even if it's not what it used to be. Great. Yes. Yeah, and I, I wonder if if something similar had happened, let's say, in the 1980s in Middletown, if there would have still been enough social capital to respond and to marshal resources in that way. Um, but, but clearly, by the time I was in high school, things had fallen off in such a significant way that it's really hard to imagine the community coming together in that sort of way. It's really hard to imagine people um, you know, contributing and dedicating enough resources to make something like that happen. Again, it's, it's one of the differences, right, that the, the, the decline of Middletown was much more gradual than the decline of Janesville. Um, but you asked me to talk a little bit about church, and it's definitely one of the most fascinating things that I, I found out, though it made sense to me intuitively, having grown up in the region, uh, that people profess very strong religious faith. If you call people and say, how do you identify, you get very few people who identify as atheists or otherwise non-religious, most people say that there's some, some version of Christianity, uh, typically Protestant evangelicanism. But if you actually dig into the church attendance rates, you see that people in Oklahoma and North Texas and Kansas and even in parts of the Northeast attend religious services much more commonly and much more frequently than people in West Virginia or Southeastern Kentucky or Southern Ohio. And so there's this weird dichotomy of people who are incredibly religious but aren't especially connected to a religious institution. And if you look at the data on where so many of the benefits of religious participation come from, they require at least some connection to a religious community. That you know, we know, for example, that children who go to church much less likely to experience addiction, much less likely to experience family trauma, much more likely to graduate from high school, to graduate from college. All of these positive benefits accrue to regular church attendance, and all of these negative consequences tend to not happen as often among regular church attendees. So you ask yourself, well, why are the people in Southern Ohio doing so poorly on a lot of these metrics like addiction or like family trauma? It's like, well, they're religious, but they're not especially connected to a church. 
Um, so I, I do think that there's a social capital problem. I do think that that sense that when you're down on your luck, there's a community of people behind you to support you, to encourage you, to lift you up, that just isn't as common in a part of the country where people are much more disconnected from, uh, from institutions of church. It's, of course, not just church. You know, Robert Putnam would talk about bowling leagues, would talk about things like VFWs and other civic organizations. Uh, if you look at the numbers, and certainly I saw this growing up, there just isn't as much connection to institutions of community. We tend to think, I think, too often of people living on their individual islands. That's sort of one vector as the individual person, maybe the family. We talk a lot about public policy at the state or federal level, but there are all of these institutions of community in my hometown that clearly just weren't doing as well as they were in other parts of the country. And again, that really drives this sense of dislocation, of pessimism, and I think of, of isolation. Um, the, the thing that ultimately, you know, one, one final point I'll say, and it harkens back a little bit to a question you asked about, you know, what do we do about this? You know, one of the policy interventions that's been tried, not on a large scale, but on a medium scale, in the past 20 or 30 years that has worked pretty well at promoting people from lower income backgrounds into achieving a middle class or an even an upper middle class lifestyle is this study that was tried in the 1990s. It was sort of a hybrid of a study, but also a public policy intervention called the Moving to Opportunity Program, which you may know some, something about, Amy. But basically the idea of the Moving to Opportunity Program was let's take people who are from rough neighborhoods and let's, instead of putting them, let's say, in uh, housing projects, let's take the money that we devote to housing projects and actually allow them to get a get their own place. This is sort of classic sub Section H, uh, excuse me, Section 8 voucherized housing, but let's not let them use it in really rough neighborhoods. In other words, let's force them to get a place in a neighborhood that's a little bit more on the up and up, that's maybe more socioeconomically diverse. And for the first five or 10 years after that study, it was treated in a lot of social science literature as a failure because what happened is that you move all these families to these new neighborhoods and by and large, they all move back. Uh, whether they're white or black, they all tend to move back to the neighborhoods that they came from. And so people were wondering, well, maybe this study didn't actually work especially well. So not too long ago, an economist at Stanford decided to look into the children who were the beneficiaries of this voucher who moved to different neighborhoods. And instead of measuring whether they stayed in the neighborhood they moved to, he actually decided to measure how long they stayed in their new neighborhood and whether it had any positive impact on their life outcomes. And what he found was incredibly striking, that the longer these kids stayed, even if they were only in the new neighborhood for two years, they had much, much higher wage earning potential, they were more likely to stay married, they had all of these positive benefits that accrued, even from getting out of that isolated environment even for a couple of years. And so I do think that one of the real bright spots, one of the real possibilities, is to make it a little bit easier for people to spend time with other folks who have a slightly different perspective on the world, who have some sense of optimism, who have some sense of possibility, who have some of the social capital that I think was so alive in Janesville, but wasn't necessarily alive, at least in the neighborhood of Middletown that I came from. So obviously social capital, very important, um, but since we're actually in theory at a banking conference, I wanted to bring up sort of actual capital. Um, and there, I mean, I thought it was very interesting. I think one of the more complex characters in Janesville was the local bank president who also led some effort to do a community real redevelopment thing, who I think, I, I infer that you were a bit ambivalent about her, um, had some ups and downs. And so maybe you could talk, Amy, about sort of the role of the, the local bank, the community bank in Janesville. And then I, I thought JD made a very interesting point about when he was in the Marine Corps, one of the great benefits of Marine Corps was basic training in personal finance. Uh, which did he did not get growing up, and you would think that would not be the place to go to get it, but apparently that was a pretty good thing. But why don't we start with Janesville? Well, going back to my kaleidoscopic metaphor, um, one of the frames um, uh, is a woman um, named uh, Mary Wilmer. She, again, has also remarried, but um, that was her name in the story. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, her marriage wasn't doing well in the story. Um, and she was the community president of the Janesville 
uh, branch of m and Bank. Uh, m and Bank was based in Milwaukee and was the biggest bank in the state. Uh, she had started out uh, at an entry-level position right out of college. Um, and her branch at the time, which no longer existed by the time I got to town, uh, was on the south side of Janesville, right near the GM plant. So her customers were GM workers. Um, her brother had worked at GM as a forklift driver uh, until he retired a couple years before the plant shut down. Um, her sister-in-law was still at the plant when it shut down. So she really got what this GM culture was about. Um, and when all of these jobs vanish, um, she had a front seat view. Uh, she is aware of you know, who's not making mortgage payments. Um, uh, I mean, there was all of this um, kind of smoke signals of financial distress that she could see. Foreclosure rates were increasing. Um, I mean, every week on the, you know, inside the lobby of the uh, local courthouse, uh, there were foreclosure auctions uh, going on. Um, and she gets pretty concerned about this. Uh, she pulls together a group of uh, bankers in the region and directors of some credit unions, uh, basically to say to each of them, well, what are you seeing? And kind of in the aggregate, they realize that uh, the impact on people's personal finances from all this job loss was much worse cumulatively than they were each seeing individually. And they developed some strategies to try to give people a break. Um, created a grace period before any of them foreclosed, although many people in town had uh, mortgages with uh, banks that weren't local, so they couldn't affect that. So she's trying, and as you mentioned, um, she becomes the co-founder of a group that was called Rock County 5.0. Um, this was a regional economic development coalition uh, with a very wealthy businesswoman from Beloit, the next town uh, to the south. Uh, and you might not think it was that big a deal for there to be a regional uh, economic development coalition, but for a long time, Janesville and Beloit were rivals. I mean, you did not read each other's newspapers. You did not go out to eat in the other town. I mean, they were very, they were 20 minutes apart, but really had separate identities. Um, part of it was based on race. Part of it was based on the fact that Beloit had lost its industry long before Janesville did, so Janesville was kind of viewed as a snooty place compared to Beloit. But they got together and said, if we're going to try to heal this thing, we need to do it jointly. So they began this very intense effort to uh, try to persuade local businesses in town to stay, uh, to try to do some recruiting, which was pretty hard to do. Um, and Mary gets into some trouble because, you know, one of the kind of tones of the economic development work was to radiate positivity. Um, so she starts wearing a hat um, with emblazoned across the front of it, like a baseball cap, ambassador of optimism. And at one point, she uh, writes kind of a New Year's Day op-ed for the local newspaper, the Janesville Gazette, that basically says, here's what we're doing with the Economic Development Coalition. And all everybody needs to do in town is become an ambassador of optimism. Well, you can imagine this didn't sit very well with all these workers who can't, for the life of them, figure out how to get a job, how to get a job that pays decently if they have a job again. Uh, so she becomes a pretty contentious figure. And she just doesn't get why people aren't with the program. Um, so, you know, at the end of the book, I sort of talk about um, the culture kind of um, dividing into what I call two Janesvilles which is people who have really firsthand felt the effects of this profound job loss and the Marys of the world who think they know what it's about but aren't living it. Yeah. Um, so there's kind of this schism that emerges both politically and socioeconomically in what had been a pretty heterogeneous community. One thing we know for sure, nobody leaving here tonight is going to be wearing a hat that says Ambassador of Optimism. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Jenny, let me turn to you. Uh. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that I, I just didn't learn 
from the way that I grew up, from the family that I was in, is sort of basic personal finance. I think it, the apocryphal statement attributed to Albert Einstein is that the eighth wonder of the world is compound interest. <laughs> and uh, I didn't realize that. And so the first time that I ever made a major purchase in my life, I went to go buy a used Honda Civic at one of these off-base car dealerships. And the, the, the dealer offered me the financing option of a 20.9% APR loan to purchase this used Honda Civic, which at the time I thought to myself, you know, he showed me the, you know, bi-weekly payment that I was going to have to make and I, I could afford it just barely, but I could afford it. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I sign on the dotted line. I pay this amount of money. I get to drive this car off the lot. Absolutely. I had the good sense to go back to my, you know, we called him NCOIC, which means non-commissioned officer in charge. His name was Shannon Arledge. And Gunnery Sergeant Arledge, when I told him what I was going to do, basically said, you are a complete idiot. You have got to stop. And they actually ordered another Marine in the unit to, unit to drive me to Navy Federal Credit Union in Havelock, North Carolina, and apply for a better loan. And I remember that loan, the APR that I got on that, I believe, was 7.8%. So still pretty high for a used car purchase, but not too bad. And uh, that you know, basically saved me a pretty significant financial catastrophe. Actually, that was the car that I drove from uh, North Carolina to Columbus to start college. That was the car that got me from Columbus, uh, or excuse me, from Middletown, Ohio, to New Haven, Connecticut to start law school. And then it pretty much died as soon as I got to New Haven. It was like that dog that got me to the top of the mountain and then just died. Uh, and, but but that, that decision that would have been a catastrophic decision uh, was, was averted because of some of the things that I learned in the United States Marine Corps. Because we think of the Marine Corps as this place that gives you a gun and teaches you how to fight. And obviously the US military is primarily oriented to fighting and winning America's battles. Uh, but it also teaches people some very basic non-cognitive cultural skills that a lot of the kids who enter the Marine Corps just don't have. And I think they benefit, it, benefit from it uh, quite a bit. There's some really good evidence that suggests that you know, people are, employers are more and more hiring for non-cognitive skills, things like grit and perseverance and a willingness to think outside of the box, a willingness to keep on working on a problem even when it's tough. And I think that the, that the U.S. military is remarkably good at teaching people not necessarily how to be you know, engineers or how to be scientists or how to teach English to a group of high schoolers, but it's really good at teaching some of those non-cognitive skills that I think make people much better citizens and eventually you know, much, much better uh, people and members of the community. Great. I think we only have time for a few more, and then this pigeonhole thing is not exactly been a roaring success, but you know, we, we, we experiment. And also, I want to assure everybody out there that JD's favorable reference to a credit union will be edited out in any recording of this session. <laughs> We're actually going to dub in the name of your bank if you ever want to rebroadcast it. Um, but uh, you know, I, I think you know, your, your reference to sort of the, the Rock County 5.0, of course, reminded me a little bit of HQ2 um, and sort of the notion I think it was some part of the book we haven't really talked about, which was basically the bidding war that Janesville and parts of Wisconsin got into with parts of Michigan over who was going to offer GM the most to save their plant, um, which is sort of the sad end of the competition with sort of HQ being who wants 20,000 or however many jobs. So any perspective on that from the maybe the sad side of bidding for jobs? But does it work? I mean, is, 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 or is it just sort of a zero-sum game where you know, a company gets very wealthy. So well, Amy works for the Washington Post, and uh, Jeff Bezos is actually an LP in my fund, so we both conflicted. <laughs> uh, so this has to be off the record if yeah. we speak yeah. honestly about Amazon. Well, um, Amazon doesn't own the Washington Post, That's but right. the owner of Amazon owns the Washington <laughs> Post. So uh, um, I don't think I'm going to say anything that's a firing offense, okay. but um, <laughs> it'll play out in the next few minutes, you can judge. Um, so um, I think the question is work out for whom? Um, you know, I've been talking a little bit about the resilience of Janesville. You know, I didn't know anything about the culture of this community when I showed up. So, you know, I sort of learned over a period of years that this place actually had this resourcefulness and tenacity. And part of that played out right after the plant closing announcement. Um, people just assumed um, that they could persuade General Motors to change its mind and give 
the General Assembly plant another product to manufacture. And they had pretty good reason for thinking that because products have been coming and going from this plant since the 1920s. So there was this enormous amount of denial um, that this time would be different. And when I say people had this assumption that they could persuade General Motors, um, it was a pretty powerful bipartisan group of people. Um, there was a Democratic governor at the time who predated Scott Walker, the Republican governor who's just lost, uh, bid for a third term, a guy named Jim Doyle. Uh, and the entire congressional delegation, Wisconsin, Democrats and Republicans alike, uh, the uh, city of Janesville, the county of Rock County, Beloit, this little town to the south, all got together and put together um, an economic incentive package uh, that was bigger than anything Wisconsin had at that point ever offered any company uh, to come back or to come into the state. And all of these folks, including the governor, just thought this was so much money that Janesville was going to win. And the winning was to get uh, the right to manufacture a new, very small car that General Motors was about to start manufacturing domestically. It was going to be the first subcompact manufactured in the United States in quite a while by any of the major car manufacturers. And uh, this bid goes in. There's a scene in my story when um, the leadership of this plant rescue effort goes trooping off to, uh, traipsing off to Detroit to meet with the leadership of uh, General Motors. They you know, have their lines all down, you know, arguing that we're an old plant, um, but our per vehicle production cost is lower than some of your newer plants, and our quality is really good, and we've been so loyal to you that you should be loyal to us. And they're absolutely shocked when it turns out that Michigan has offered General Motors five times as much money in economic incentives uh, to manufacture this small car at a plant called uh, the Orion Township uh, uh, plant, uh, assembly plant, uh, which is a plant that wasn't closed but was going to be closed if this uh, rescue didn't happen. So the plant doesn't reopen. Um, now, I think there's a question, which I talk a little bit about in the book, about what does winning look like? Because this was a time when General Motors, I mean, it was about to start manufacturing this product in the United States, and it was worried about union wages. So the company had, in the previous um, UAW GM contract, uh, worked out the right to, over, to uh, pay lower wages to new workers. Uh, it was going to be $14 an hour instead of $28 an hour, big differential. And the union local at this Michigan plant, they were so worried that GM would change his mind uh, that they actually agreed to greater concessions than the union contract so that some of the existing workers who didn't have much seniority when this plant started back up were making half the pay as people they were working next to. Um, so let me do, I'm going to do the one pigeonhole the question that got more than two votes. Um, and then I was going to finish up by asking each of you to ask the other a question about your book. They actually never met until tonight, but they had actually read each other's books. Uh, so that, so uh, the pigeonhole is, I grew up in northern England with dependence on clothing manufacturing. Um, I can emphasize with communities whose industry has collapsed. What should the USA do to support these communities in transition? I mean, to some extent, we've touched on this, but any any further thoughts on that? Well, so d despite some of the experience we've had with retraining, I, and I do think that you know the model of community college retraining, where effectively administrators sit in a room and try to anticipate where the labor market is going to be in three years, and then match their workforce to that hypothetical labor market, that hasn't worked especially well. But I, I do think that we should be as, as especially state governments, especially innovative in trying to sit down with employers, figure out what the needs of the workforce are gonna be from the perspective of the employers, and actually make it easier for people to get the credentials and skills necessary to work in jobs that employers are actually gonna have. I think that, uh, that there have been some successes using that model where it's employer-driven as opposed to um, administrator-driven, um, but it's not, it's not perfect. Uh, the, 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 the other thing I'd say is that 
you know, obviously retraining and sort of making it easier for the workforce that we have to work in the jobs that are going to exist a few years down the road, that's important. But I do think that policy elites have been especially blind to how difficult transition actually is. And one of the goals of public policy, you know, we can't all be Luddites, we can't prevent the progression of the economy, we can't prevent a lot of these things from happening, uh, but we should probably be a little bit more sensitive to how difficult transition is and make it a little bit easier for, uh, or, or, or try to blunt some of the impacts of these transitions. And what I, what I mean particularly is, you know, we, we know that the American manufacturing sector lost about seven million jobs uh, to Chinese trade competition, I believe from 1999 until about 2000. And 11. Uh, that's an extraordinary amount of job loss to absorb in what is 12, 13, 14 years. And I, and I do think that what everybody said is that, well, the economic pie will grow, everybody will be a little better off, we'll obviously gain access to Chinese markets even as they gain access to American markets. And what happened in practice is that while we can sort of debate the long-term impacts, the short-term impacts of American policy, especially manufacturing policy vis-a-vis -vis China, was pretty disastrous for manufacturing workers in the middle of the country. Uh, I don't think that's, that's basically disputable. Now, again, you can argue that the net effects were positive, but for a very uh, concentrated part of the country, it was really, really tough. And so I, I do think that we should go into the next big conversation about economic transition with a little bit more humility. I mean, everyone knew that this was going to be tough, but what everybody said is, well, we'll just retrain all these workers. We'll turn all the, the coal miners into coders. We'll turn all the displaced auto workers into workers in the new economy. And that's a little bit harder. And given that it's actually as hard as we all know that it now is, I think we should have a little bit more humility about how we approach that change and how we embrace it. One last real quick one, because I think it was asked here twice in different ways, and then we'll go to our bilateral. Um, in a lightning round, how is Janesville doing today? Um, I was just in Janesville last month for the first time in many months, and um, the plant is now being torn down. Um, I mean, it was pretty sobering for me. I mean, I was pretty emotional looking at this demolition site, and it's not even my place, you know, but it was pretty hard to see. Um, and I guess the point I want to make is um, the dodge I was going to make to avoid answering the last question, um, which is that I've come to think that it takes a very long time in some cases for it to become clear whether a community is going to recover or vanish uh, economically. Um, in the case of Janesville, uh, you know, I talked about this denial that was perpetuated for a long time. And, that denial was partly as a result of the community's traditions, but partly because for several years, uh, this was the only closed plant in all of General Motors uh, that was in a limbo status called standby, uh, which meant that there was absolutely nothing going on inside this uh, dead auto plant, um, but that the company said, if the market circumstances warranted it, it might be reopened. So that fueled a lot of hope for a lot of, a lot of years. And eventually, uh, in the last UAW contract in 2015, the plant was formally designated as permanently closed. Uh, so it took years for that to happen. And the plant was sold off. And it was bought um, late last year by a company out of St. Louis that specializes in distressed industrial property and has been doing some environmental cleanup and taking down the plant. And it is completely unclear what's going to happen to that land. Huge tract of land. Uh, so it's been a decade. And I think in a fundamental way, the future is still not known. OK. Now, a tough question for him. <laughs> OK. <laughs> well, um, so I think that what each of us has researched and written is at root about the fragility of the American dream and about um, sort of the myth of upward mobility. Um, and it seems to me that you found upward mobility by leaving. Mm. And I'm wondering if, I mean, you're a proponent of 
self-reliance, individual responsibility. Um, yes. Can, you know, even if, you know, you talk about these two different groups of people, the people who are sort of marginally improvable mm -hmm. and the people who are multi-generationally a mess. Sure. Um, to use the technical term. Um, so are there any examples of people who have found upward mobility by not leaving? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, Good. <laughs> she's a reporter, you know. It, 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 I, I guess it depends on what you mean by not leaving. There are certainly friends from high school who have found some way to participate in the modern economy, who have found some measure of financial stability, and who haven't left town. Or at least they maybe work 25 minutes away in Cincinnati or you know, 30 minutes away in Dayton, but they've raised their families in Middletown. And I, and I do think that gives, I think, some insight into what, m how we might think of a long-term way to create more, if not sort of significant upward mobility, at least more financial stability among middle-class Americans. And that's, I think we have to, in some ways, figure out how to arrest some of the geographic divergence that exists in the American economy. So this is why I ask, you know, it depends on what you mean by not leaving. Because I can't think of anybody who has been truly upwardly mobile but is working in Middletown. Mm. I can think of a lot of people who are upwardly mobile who work in Cincinnati or work in Dayton or work someplace nearby. And what worries me most about the American economy, when I, when I think about it, you know, people ask me a lot, should we save every small town? I don't think we can save every small town. We can't save every, every Janesville. We can't save every Middletown. What I do think we can do is create more pockets of prosperity such that when a kid like me gets out of college, we don't give them the choice of moving to San Francisco or not having any upward mobility. Uh, if you give people the choice to move to Columbus, Ohio, or to Indianapolis, or to Cincinnati, or to Louisville, a lot more people are gonna make that choice because at least then they can still maintain some connection to the communities that made them who they are. Maybe they, they're not gonna be able to stay in Janesville. Maybe they can have something in Madison. Maybe they can have something in Milwaukee. And I, and I do think that is at least part of the story, is it's not just that our small towns are struggling. We've always had small towns struggling for the past 200, you know, the entire history of the American economy is a history of dynamism, of creative destruction. And sometimes that's hit a lot of small towns especially hard. Uh, what I think is really unique is that when we talk about geographic, or when we talk about centers of prosperity, it's all in the Northeast, it's all in San Francisco. There are very, very few places in the American economy right now that are doing especially well that aren't on one of the coasts. And I think that's a big part of the equation is not, you know, is everybody gonna stay in Middletown, but can at least people maintain some degree of financial comfort by moving, let's say, 30 miles away as opposed to 3,000 miles away. And so, um, my, my question for you is, uh, so obviously you spent a lot of time in Janesville and you're a reporter, you see a lot of, of what's going on in the American economy. Um, I loved your book. I was definitely left, especially the community college piece made me worried about, you know, what do we do here? What's the way out? And I'm wondering when you think about the future of the country, and you think about the people in Janesville and some of the problems that exist in Janesville but also exist elsewhere, what makes you optimistic about the country? Well, um, I'm going to maintain my Janesville-centric lens. Sure. Because um, that's what I spent nearly six years researching. Sure. And I think what makes me optimistic is, you know, the social capital thing that we talked about. Um, I mean, it turns out that this is a community with a lot of generosity yep. and a lot of um, philanthropic, so it's, you know, small bore philanthropic impulse. Um, there were just lots and lots of fundraisers going on in town um, for the uh, little free clinic, uh, medical clinic, because um, people were losing health insurance along with jobs, uh, for the food pantry uh, that was created in the 1960s by a coalition of churches. Mm. Um, None of it was raising enough money, but there was a lot of uh, involvement, a lot of participation. Yep. And I think, you know, you talked at the outset about, uh, in response to the question about um, the social science uh, literature um, uh, that you uh, learned and wrote about, 
about pessimism. Janesville is, you know, one of the things I get asked often is, who are people in Janesville angry at? And one of the things that really surprised me is, not that nobody's pissed off, yeah. but the relative lack of anger. I mean, and I think that that stems from the absence of pessimism. I mean, people, you know, sometimes in what struck me as foolish ways were holding on to shards of signs that the economy was getting better, mm -hmm. um, that were sort of out of proportion to the reality. But I think that that fundamental optimism or sense of local resilience is a very American trait yep. and is very present in this community I wrote about. Oh, that was good. We ended on yeah. an optimistic note. That was well done, Katie. So please join me in thanking these two. This is... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.